Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Manila House, this is Bambina Olivares, Director of Programming, welcoming members and non-members alike to today's webinar, Between the Covers, What Are You Reading and How Did It Become a Book? I'm delighted to see that we have a lot of book lovers here, young and, well, younger. And for those who ordered the calzone today, I hope you're enjoying your afternoon snack. We're very honored today to have an amazing group of insiders in the publishing industry, and we hope to have a lively and insightful discussion of what it takes to get a book into print, into stores, and into readers' hands. Allow me to introduce today's speakers. So we have Stephen Morrison with us. Stephen has worked in the international publishing industry for 25 plus years. He was editor-in-chief of Penguin Books in New York City, and most recently was a publisher of Picador Books. He's currently an IP content developer of various book and TV projects, a writer and a consultant for the media and publishing industries with recent clients, including PBS's Masterpiece Theater and the Paris and New York-based Susanna Lee and Agency. Karina, Karina, you have a really long bio. I'm going to read just the first part. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, Karina is uh, um, the director of the Atenea de Manila University Press. She was cited as publisher of the year, last three consecutive years, 2017 to 2019. She serves as vice chair for external affairs of the Book Development Association of the Philippines, or BDAP. She also sits on the boards of the Philippine PEN, Writers Union of the Philippines, and the Outstanding Women in the Nation Service, the Towns. From 2011 to 2019, she sat as governor of the National Book Development Board. And before that, she was with Anvil Publishing. In fact, um, full disclosure, Karina was my publisher in Anvil. So um, thanks, Karina. It's, it's an honor to have you here. And um, Honey de Peralta was formerly an English teacher at the Ateneo, a national teacher trainer for FAPE, as well as general manager Flipside, the country's first ebook only publisher and ebook store. She also served as general manager of Rex Digital, the educational technology arm of Rex Bookstore, and co-founded the Filipino Reader Con. Currently, she works for Penguin Random House US, the world's largest English language trade publisher, a sales manager for the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Myanmar. And Last but not least, we have Katia Lichauco and Enzo Santos. Um, they're kind of new to the trade. They're the co-founders of Staff Picks, an independent e-commerce bookstore that launched on Instagram in April. Katia is also a writer and an editor, while Enzo is a young entrepreneur behind Oven Depot. So thank you for joining us again today. And let me just, um, just uh, reiterate a few ground rules before we begin. This webinar is being recorded and will be up on the Manila House YouTube channel in a day or two. Please use the chat box and the Q&A box for any questions and comments, and we'll get to your questions as we go along. Thanks so much. So let me begin with Stephen, who will give us a behind the scenes look into how blockbusters and bestsellers emerge from the slush pile. And more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think one of the things that all of us who are here talking today are all involved with the exciting process of publishing books. And the thing that I think is always surprising when you're not in the publishing business is how long publishing a book can take. You know, you need the writer to write it. You need the writer to then find an agent, find a publisher. And then as the book buyer and reader, you walk into the bookstore or you hear about a book from Katja and Enzo and buy the book. And um, it, as, a, as a consumer, it feels as if the book just dropped into your lap. You just happen to hear it, you know, see it on Instagram or hear about it on the radio last night or read a review. And it seems as if the book just happened. This, this moment of serendipity happened. From behind the scenes, and I guess Karina, you can we, you speak to this. The process of publishing a book is almost a sort of art uh, because there are so many people involved in the process of publishing a book whom you don't see. So there could be, at some point, I think a, a friend of mine, your work colleague, um, you know, said to me there are probably, I think it was 38 different people who would be involved in a book's publication from it being signed up to being copy edited to the contract being done to the cover being designed to it being copy edited, laid out, et cetera, you know, to, you know, Honey and her team selling it to the bookstore or exporting it around the world, et cetera. 
Uh, and it's sort of a, a, a magical, amazing process. When it works, when you have a book as a publisher that you are incredibly excited about, and ideally you're ex equally excited about all of your books, but when you really work hard and all the, and er, all the pieces of the machinery or of, of the, the, all, all the people involved get behind a book and can really um, amplify that excitement uh, and really spread that enthusiasm out into the world in whatever ways you can reach people. And it touch, touches people and they buy the book and love the book and pat, you know, word of mouth, pass it on. It's really an exciting process from a publisher's perspective because I think unlike any other piece of art or, or piece of culture, it, a book really, really requires an investment of human time. You know, none of us are going to read a book any faster than four hours or, you know, and only if we're a speed reader. And when you've invested that much time reading a book and you love it, you're going to tell people about it. Whereas if you listen to a two minute song and you share it with somebody quickly, it's all sort of shareable, but it doesn't, the excitement is harder to share. You know, oh, we have a, we have a, 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 a guest. Um, they, um, uh, so anyway, I lose. I got distracted by Jennifer showing up as well. Um, but um, so the process of publishing is a very exciting one when it works. And, and you were saying, how does a big blockbuster happen? Some of it is by strategy. Some of it's by hard work. And some of it, again, with any artistic creation, some of it is the zeitgeist. And some of it is just the public taste and having to be publishing the right book at the right time that for some reason is speaking to people. And as a publisher, part of your job is trying to help people understand why this is the book they should be reading now. So that, that's my little qu quick summation of the process from behind the scenes or, or my experience of it working at primarily at Penguin and Bloomsbury and uh, Picador. Hey, thanks, Stephen. I'm sure you'll give us more, um, you know, insider, you'll give us an inside track later on as, as we go along. Um, now I'm going to turn you over to Karina. And um, Karina, you know, I'd like to ask Karina about book publishing, the history of book publishing in the Philippines, because Anvil, under her, Anvil became the preeminent local publisher. And now she's shaking up the Ateneo University Press. So maybe you can tell us about, you know, the, as we said, the history of book publishing and also the difference between a commercial press and the university. Karina. Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, I, uh, I, I still am always being asked to tell the story of Anvil, which I guess is but right, because I spent about 26 years running Anvil. Uh, we started it in 1990, and before that, that was four years after the People Power, EDSA People Power, and, uh, you know, it was like a dam exploded with the freedom and the restoration of democratic rights. And so, uh, we, I always say that the story of Anvil is when the book became really personal. I say this because... Uh, we have always been uh, associate, I mean, books here are most in the beginning. I mean, when I got into the publishing scene, it was really more imported books. Uh, National Bookstore, which is the biggest uh, and the major importer, um, I think has, had, has been making books available from abroad for over 75 years now, I think, because Mrs. Ramos, uh, the matriarch, started in 19... 41, even during the war. You know? So, um, so uh, having said this, though, this is not uh, this is not as if we we're saying that this was bad because uh, I, I mean many reading teachers always say that Mrs. Ramos and National Bookstore has done more for the reading education in this country than anybody else because by making these books available. I mean, you don't have to say anything more. I mean, some of the stores uh, in Metro Manila before they went to the provinces were like libraries. I mean, young people would go there, read, uh, stay and read before they bought books or they would not even buy the books, but just read them there no, in the stores. 
anyway, so in 1990, we, we thought that maybe it was time for uh, to develop in a, it, it was like we frenetically developed writing by Filipinos. No? So while we tried to parallel all the genres that, that the imported books uh, of imported books that were available, because in the beginning, they, they, they just had a small corner in the bookstore called Filipiniana and you have very, you had very few books there. And, and while, you know, some people are saying ban imported importation of books or tax them to make them more expensive to protect the local books. That was not the way to do that, but you, you had to appropriate the space in the store. So that means even at that time, if national bookstore said, okay, bring in more local books, there were no local books. Before that, uh, the books were just all textbooks or academic or scholarly books or religious books. Uh, there was there was kind of an active uh, publication, uh, publishing going on on Panay Avenue during the 70s. The Constantinos were across Hilda Cordero Fernando. So they were both producing different types of books, but for the same, for the same reason. You know? The GCF books was producing beautiful books, uh, going back into our culture, recovering what was uh, glossed over or what was replaced by uh, foreign stories, uh, going back to our own myths and legends, studying our art. And the Constantinos across, because they were neighbors on Panay Avenue, were writing the, the cheap monographs that the activist generation read, miseducation of the Filipino, of the veneration without understanding. So uh, all this, all this uh, we, we felt that we had, when I say truly personal, we had to tell, we had to encourage local writers to write about their own self-help books, uh, all types, all genres. You know? So I think the 26 years we, we, and it was also clearly our mandate when Anvil was spun off by National Bookstore, which was to also produce as many locally written books for the stores. You know? So this was also a way of balancing, uh, balancing taste and offering the Filipino community more options that would talk. Of course, when you read a novel by an American writer, it can resonate with you. And in that sense, it's personal. But when I say truly personal, we're talking about uh, health books that talk about our diseases here. We're talking about uh, personal experiences that really happen to Filipinos. So, uh, so this was what we encouraged and in all genres. And I think we, we, we produced a lot of titles during this period. And the way to do that was to form many small teams per book project. As Stephen was saying, it's a very difficult process, but to be able to produce 80 titles a year. And we, we did all kinds. No? We did textbooks at Anvil. We did children's books, all kinds of trade books, self-help, fiction, literature. Uh, everything you know so children's books as well uh, i think i said that so uh i think we were able to do that and eventually um probably paved the way for other things to to uh to grow and uh to evolve especially writing in filipino writing about really even more personal and intimate things uh for filipinos um, so the shift to a university press was really, uh, although we were already doing a few scholarly books or academic titles at Advil, very few, but the shift to a university press was really uh, very, not, not really radical, but because it's the same, the same process except for the peer reviews, uh, because when you're in a university press, uh, your submissions are to be subject to a double blind review. So a double blind review is the reviewer doesn't know who wrote the manuscript and the, the author will not ever know who reviewed her, his or her submission. And then these uh, reviews are vetted by an editorial board who, which is composed of faculty from different schools of the Ateneo. So. 
uh, that's one di big difference because at Anvil, we it was a lot of uh, marketing decision more than anything else. No, uh, I would often find myself arguing with the marketing group because there were books that I felt had to be published but may not sell. Uh, in the first year of Anvil, we had Ambeth Ocampo, Margie Holmes, uh, who else? We had uh, uh, even even publishing uh, the series of books of Margie Holmes. Uh, the, 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 there were there was there was positive reaction, there was negative reaction, but we felt that we were, especially later, they were translated to Filipino. We we felt that it was a way to empower uh, Filipino women on issues that were not spoken about or discussed openly but are treated as jokes so this is sex and i used to i used to tease margie that they also she her books in a way subsidized the poetry line you know, because we were also publishing poetry so you had to have a mix of sellers and books that may not so sell as fast as or as uh, well but have to be put out for cultural growth and for literary growth you know? So in the, I don't know, am I beyond my, my time? Uh, in Ateneo, uh, the, the, main, the main challenge for me was public engagement because these were highly academic and scholarly books, rigorously researched and studied their findings, their oral interviews, but are hardly read. No? Well, some, sometimes because it's, the way it's written, it's so dense. Uh, even if it's recast from a dissertation or a thesis, still not everybody is equipped or has the talent to write it in a way that would be accessible. No? So we opened a Bughao imprint. It's a line which is a little bit more popular or accessible. It covers uh, literature, uh, autobiographies or memoirs of, you know, important people because that's also social history and uh, anthologies which are which could be topical but are multi-authored and interdisciplinary you know? so that's how popular or accessible we 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 go and we're we as i was saying earlier in during the pandemic i think the upside was because of the it's easier to bring people together for authors to come together and talk about issues. It was also easier to engage the public, which is so important. Uh, we had titles which, which were in the backlist would be put back in front or in center because, because of the public mood or the, the, uh, the political situation, for example, or uh, the government. Uh, some government policy that people were wanted to engage with, you know. So it it was a matter. It was easier to bring to the attention of the public that wanted to understand what was happening. It was easier to make them to let them know that there are such books available that can help you understand the situation. So I think when we resumed operations in June of 2020, that was an emotional month for for us i guess that was independence day so uh we also have a young marketing group that's you know they said history books are on sale but not history campaigns like that no so and we we uh we we bundled books together at a discount i think the online selling has allowed us to pass on the discounts to the public, to the consumer, more than uh, a dealer network, no? Because you know, of course, the bookstores have to get a commission because there's they have physical stores. They put your books in real spaces, right? But um, Shopee and Lazada don't store, don't they? Don't keep books. They refer orders to you, and you you service. So everybody's become a digital consumer, and we were really. But they're still ordering physical books. No? And we were really happy to note that our sales improved so much. Uh, public engagement, we're, we're learning more uh, how to respond to situations. As I said earlier, uh, I cited the example of Rock Solid, 
you know, and there was a controversial statement or turnaround by Enrile on it. We, we put back the book, uh, made people remember what he said in the, in the book. And we go as far as even maybe offering Rappler membership or subscription with, with the book as a premium. No? So you have to learn to, to respond as quickly to the public mood. Uh, and that seems to be easier to monitor online than before, than with traditional media. And you see that right away and you're able, and you have to respond as quickly. I don't know, maybe people can just ask questions later. I think I've said a mouthful. <laughs> Thanks, Karina. Um, I'll go to Honey now, and uh, Honey will talk to us about bringing international titles to this market. Thank you, Bambina. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, I'm Honey. I, I work as a sales manager for um, for one of the big five publishers, um, the largest one, Penguin Random House. And um, but Stephen was saying earlier that you know sometimes when you walk into a bookstore and you're an ordinary reader and you think that oh, just the the books just appear there. That's really um, sort of like the end part of the process. Um, Stephen was saying that there are like 38 people who will probably, I, I don't know if 38 includes sales and marketing, Stephen, <laughs> but um, after the book goes through the process of publishing and like, you know, all of the design, um, talking about like how to, how to position it and how to market it, then um, it goes to people like us um, who are in sales. So um, it goes to marketing first because they have to talk about like, you know, which titles um, will be presented to sales and then, then that's where we come in. And um, our role is sort of like, you know, you were asking like how do books get into the market? Um, it's really like, I like to tell people it's, um, it's love. <laughs> and I know that's weird, but it's actually something I hear a lot. So um, why love? Okay. So. Just think of Penguin Random House. Um, in a recent talk that the CEO um, gave, Marcus Dole, um, he said that we publish 15,000 titles a year. So can you imagine that's like 15,000 books a year? These are new titles. Some of them are like new editions and um, some of them might be like, you know, there's a hardcover and there's a, there's a paperback edition. So let's just say maybe like around 11,000 titles a year. Regardless of whether it's 15,000 or 11,000 titles a year, that's a lot of titles per year. And that's just from one major publisher. That doesn't include the four other major publishers or like the small indie publishers. So how do you like sell 15,000 or 11,000 titles a year? Um, and that's where marketing and sales comes in. And I mentioned love because uh, after a book has been like, you know, after the publication date has been set, then that's when um, the publishers, the editors will start presenting it to the salespeople. So like in our case in international sales, um, we will have like, you know, we'll have the usual emails telling us that these are the priority reads that are coming um, in six months or so for, so for the next season. So for example, right now um, in the U.S. it's summer. So it's the summer season. And we'll likely be talking about the books that are coming out in fall in the U.S. already. We'll already be reading titles that will be coming out in 2022. And that's because we need to figure out, like, okay, among, like, these thousands and thousands of titles, which titles will actually work for our market? You know, some titles will work just for the U.S. market, but there might not be a lot of interest in Asia. Or there are some titles where you have, like, more interest in Asia and then, um, that's only when I, I suppose the U.S. or the West was interested in it. One specific example actually is um, Kevin Kwan's Crazy Rich Asians. You know, this picked up, it was picked up faster in Asia than it was in the U.S. So when the editors and the publishers present the titles to us in sales, they actually talk a lot about love. <laughs> they say that, you know, they have to pitch it to us basically. So it's a whole process of selling. It's a process of the editors and the publishers selling it to marketing. It's a process of marketing, selling the book to sales. And they'll say that we love this title, you know. So um, there can be many things that can convince you to include um, a certain title in like the list of titles that you're presenting to a bookstore for your market. Um, but yeah, like down the line, 
um, even when it reaches, let's say, our marketing, or even when it comes to the point that we are reading the priority reads, um, let's say for 2022, the ones that we include, you know, a lot of it, of course, are titles that we know will work or have, you know, have sold before or have done well, or it's a trend. But um, we also always include titles that we love and that we enjoyed reading. So, um, so once like all of the titles are presented to us, once we read, of course, not everything, but some of them, then we have like a list of titles that we start showing to our accounts, showing to our um, booksellers. And, um, and really, let's say like out of 11,000 titles, we can only really show like maybe a few thousand. We try our best to show as many titles as possible to give everyone a chance. But um, in terms of time, you can only really present a few or just, just a fraction of that. Um, and so our job actually as sales managers is to, is to talk to the bookstores and the booksellers. Um, if we have 15,000 titles and let's say HarperCollins has this number of titles and Simon Schuster has this number of titles, our job is to make sure that these books get in front of the booksellers, get in front of the decision makers. They know what titles are coming out. They know why they should buy these titles. And basically to inform them that, you know, these are the upcoming titles. There's a new title coming out from Haruki Murakami. There's, a, uh, there's an upcoming title coming from, uh, from John Doerr, who's like the best-selling nonfiction writer. So, um, so we talk about those titles. We present it to them. And it's also our job to know what um, what our booksellers are interested in. Like, you know, um, bookstores aren't always going to carry the same thing. So, for example, a large bookstore will have like a different selection of titles. An indie bookstore um, like Staff Picks uh, perhaps will present a more curated list or will acquire a more curated list. Um, so we figure out like, you know, what works best for our markets, but also what our booksellers will be more interested in. Um, and once you present those titles, then, then yeah, then the booksellers start ordering the titles, um, hopefully. And maybe like there are some titles that, you know, we're, we believe in very strongly, but the booksellers are like, eh, maybe, you know, this won't really work for our store, or it won't really work for our region, or this person is not that popular here, or things like that. Um, and maybe we'll let it go. But maybe we'll come back and say that, but no, this is like a super interesting title. So like there's a lot of that process um, of also communicating our belief in the book and our love for the book so that bookstores decide to carry that title. Um, and I'll stop there. There's a lot more. Uh, but if you have questions, then yeah, you can address it to me later. Yeah, I, I'm sure. Thanks, honey. I'm sure people have a lot of questions. So we'll, we'll discuss that in the Q&A, definitely. And now I'm gonna turn you over to Katya and Enzo, who've both started this wonderful online bookstore from scratch, really, and, and they'll tell us a little bit about their, their journey. So Katya and Enzo, let me spotlight you guys. There you go. Our, our, hey. our Gen Xers. <laughs> go for it, Kat. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Katya. I'm the co-founder of Staff Picks, which is this e-commerce indie bookstore that my partner Enzo and I started in April, but it's actually been many months in the making. So Staff Picks, as I said, um, it's an e-commerce indie bookstore. Enzo came to me with this idea many months ago, um, early on in the pandemic last year. And it's funny because we, we are both really avid readers, but we read totally different books. Enzo reads more business, philosophy, self-help. I read more literary fiction, memoir, gender studies titles. And so we decided, you know, we think this would be a good partnership because we could cater to different people's interests. But at the same time, the whole concept was really to sell our own personal libraries and our own collections and really keep things as curated as possible. Um, I think also in terms of like how we decided on calling our bookstore staff fix, um, one of our favorite ways of discovering new titles was looking at the staff fix shelves in actual bookstores. And that was really um, the whole idea that we were going for and that we hope to communicate to our buyers as well. Um, yeah, we knew right away that that's what we wanted. It was actually the first name that we thought of and it stuck. Um, 
and we really wanted people to feel like we thought carefully about what we were going to be stocking. Um, like what Kanye was saying about choosing the books that we love and really hoping that people feel that. Um, I think that's something we really try our best to do because we look at different publishers as well and they're just so, so many books that um, we wish we could stock to. But it also depends on, you know, like how audiences receive it and all. And we just had our first launch. So we're still getting the pulse of like what people want to read or what they like to read or what they hope or um, eventually going to stock in our next collections. Yeah. I think in our first collection, we had about 50 different titles. And what you mentioned exactly, honey, um, it's choosing the books you love. We went through thousands of different books uh, presented to us by HarperCollins, uh, Penguin Random House, and it's being able to choose and define the ones that you want to sell. Because at the end of the day, we're the ones stocking them. And if you actually go to my dining table, you'll see books there that have sold out and then the leftovers. Um, so it's hit and miss with different titles, but we try our best to present authors that we really love and titles we love that I'm only going to sell a book that I want to, to read myself. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, we want to cater to both readers and non-readers alike. So, you know, people always prefer, I think, personal recommendations and books are definitely not exempt from this because when you, when you recommend a book that you love, you have your own story attached to it as well. And um, that's something that you communicate when you refer it to someone else. And that's also something that we had in mind, which is also why we decided to use Instagram as our main platform, especially to start out with. Um, personally, I didn't think that a lot of readers congregated on the platform. Um, but then I realized, you know, like all the publishing houses have their own Instagram accounts. They promote their books there. They get readers to promote books for them, um, books to grammars, book influencers, that sort of thing. And we decided, you know, like there are really lots of readers um, on this platform and let's meet them where they're at. And um, so we knew it right away that Instagram would be our main platform to begin with. And I think it's also good for us because we're able to see what will sell and what won't because how we do it is we release our collections. Well, we've only had one but it's like on a drop basis. So there's a lot of hype that we try to build around it. And um, it's first come first serve basis. So people have to comment and like put, um, like claim dibs on a book. And we're able to see like, you know, which posts like have more comments and which ones don't. So we also get a good grasp on the readership, at least locally. And also like, it, it feels nice knowing that like the books that we love um, will eventually end up in the hands of people who will hopefully love them too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, so I think we've got a, I think the only one that's missing here is actually, well, the marketing, but there's another layer, right? Steven, I'm sure you're gonna, um, you're gonna correct me if I'm wrong, but let me spotlight everyone as well. I think um, it's the marketing department as well that, that we missed, right? That's another step that's... Yeah, well, marketing and publicity, which are very, they yeah. are in a publishing house, they're, they're, they're sort of intertwined. Marketing in some ways is in a very simplified way is the, is the marketing you do that you pay for in a certain way, whether you're buying advertising or you have sales reps going out and working for you or you're, in America, in some bookstores, you actually have to pay for placement uh, uh, to get your books up front. Whereas publicity is the um, marketing you're hoping to get just on the strength of the book and your excitement and the news that it's coming out. And you'll have publicists out there pitching books to grammars and the New York Times and anybody who will listen, hoping that they will uh, cover your book. Um, so, but marketing is absolutely key because there is the way the targeting that Katya and Enzo are able to do, it is, you know, publishing a book is about finding all the different, different constituencies who can want to hear about your book. Because if you can find the most energized constituencies, they can really help you develop that word of mouth, which even in an odd way, even social media can't mimic. When 
there really is inherent word of mouth in a book that people love. They will press it on other people through any means necessary, either through conversations or their own social media posts or whatever. So that is, um, marketing is so key. And it's about tar you know, targeting and trying, ideally finding the right places to get the message going, whether it be paid for or free publicity or any of that, but it's so important. And booksellers are really, as Honey was saying, booksellers of all stripes are on the front lines of that too, because they are sort of the first people outside of the publishing house who are there to be your advocates. So you really have to win them over. I mean, you have to win the media over too, but you, you know, a very engaged, motivated bookseller is again, a really a fantastic asset. So you're really, to sell to them and to market them early enough that they can build excitement around a book is so important. To add to that, Stephen, okay. sorry. Um, no, I just wanted ahead. to mention that it's really interesting because one thing that we've done with Staff Picks is, well, personally, I read more of the business, um, self-help and philosophy books, whereas Kat gets more into literary fiction and memoirs. So putting all of that two, I'd say, personas into staff picks. So I sort of, I'd say, defined um, what we cater to, our audience. So it's not when you go to a typical bookstore and you can see every single genre available. So we're really refined in terms of having, I'd say, two different personas backing uh, several, maybe a handful of genres so that it's more unique and sort of that's why the books we do uh, read and sell are recommended. They are sort of marketed to these particular personas. So do you read everything you sell? Um, well, honey, you were saying that you, you, you personally advocate for a book, right? So you, she reads all 15,000 books. I do, year. I do. I was gonna yes. say that's a lot, 15,000. <laughs> no, um, we, we can just with a number of books that we have. So like everything that we sell, we can't really read it, but we do learn about it. So what that means is that we, we know what the book is about. We know the author. We know the key selling points. And, um, and just to like reiterate, like I was talking earlier about love. And yes, we do advocate like books that we love. But that we also sell books that we don't particularly like or, you know, are not, you know, it's not our preference. Um, because um, if you're a publisher and if you're a sales manager for a publishing house you sort of know that there is a reader for every book and what you want to do is you want to be able to like find the reader for that book so um like um Stephen was saying um it's important for marketing to identify like who are the people excited about the book that's why niches work very well now that's why fandom communities work very well because they're the ones who bring the news out um so you have to identify them you have to know who they are. Um, and when we talk about a book, actually, we also try to identify it. We'd say that these are for readers of like this book. These are for people who love watching the show. Uh, so there is a place for basically everything. There's a place for small bookstores, indie bookstores that curate their titles. There's a place for large bookstores that carry everything. Um, because you do have like different readers and they are interested in different things. and we want to be able like to serve those things. Like if we publish a book, if we sell a book, we want to make sure that it finds its readers. And we also know that who those readers are. So, so yeah, um, I will, we will usually advocate for books that we love, but we, we have no issues with selling books that we will typically like, I'm, I'm mostly an adult fiction reader, um, literary fiction, science, science fiction, fantasy, romance, you know, there are some categories that I don't read a lot of, but I will sell those um, because they do have readers. And what we want to do is to find those readers. But that, that's the big, I mean, for me, I always thought that I didn't realize until, you know, the last maybe five, six years or, or 10 years that the Philippines has a big, you know, they're big readers here as well, because I think it was Neil Gaiman that said that he, you know the welcome that he received here was like it made it made Brazilians Filipinos make Brazilians look you know conservative or shy or something but there is a book reading public a book buying public and I think 
you, you can see that when they have, when you have events, honey, I'm sure you know this, but when, like we had Manila House, we've had a few of those events. So we had yeah. Gia Tolentino and we had a huge turnout for that. We had, um, well, Elda as well, Elda Rotor, when she talked about, you know, Penguin Classics, there was also, you know, quite a good turnout. I think, I think a little more concentrated, but still a good turnout. And then Kevin Kwan, of course, there's always, you know, a lot of people, but my daughter who reads a lot of YA would go to events here when she was here, she'd go to events with YA authors and you'd have to go so early. It would be so packed. So, you know, I think it's a misnomer to think that Filipinos don't read because they, they actually do. So, which is, and also, I guess it validates your experience, right? Katya and Enzo and then Karina also. Yeah. Well, our, our case is different because we have a specialized uh, audience. In fact, we, uh, we, we say that, uh, that the, our runs are small. The press, the university press is an expression or an extension of the university's mission. And while it may not be really a profit center, which is, which is uh, a relief, right? Because you don't have to look at the bottom line. Uh, but yeah. I always tell my staff that these books are useless if they're not read. So even if they're not bought, they should be in libraries where people will read this pioneering and rigorously research studies because it's such a waste. So uh, it's, it's a different market altogether. So even if you print uh, five, well, this was before the, you know, the, the engagement wasn't right there no i mean unlike in other countries where when they have uh news events or analysis political when they analyze the political situation and all that they bring in authors of books who have studied this mm -hmm. uh situation right we don't do that here <laughs> maybe a little bit more now i mean you find political analysts on tv sometimes and uh but not as much it's not uh a standard procedure for media or even for people, uh, for legislators or for policy makers that they, they do a little research of what's already there and so that it helps them form and shape policies you know, for people, for communities. Uh, so that, that is the, the big disconnect between the, the academic and scholarly books and the people there, you know, the communities they're supposed to impact. So. Uh, so that for us, because like a print run of 500, where you have a country where the universe for libraries, for college and university libraries is 2,000, you'd think it should all go and sell, sell, because all libraries should have at least a copy of every new title that the university press puts out. No, but that's that's not uh, the case. So that's that's why it's really challenging to improve public engagement, and I I felt that. You know, this was uh, the pandemic. One of the upside of the pandemic was this really to improve because before you, it would take, we, we didn't even launch or organize any event around our books because it was expensive. You have to bring, you have to get a venue, you have to serve food and all that. Now you just can bring in even Filipinists who are not Filipinos. I mean, there are many scholars abroad who study the Philippines uh, you have a Spaniard who, who wrote Convents of Manila. You have he William Henry Scott wrote The Barangay, which is a foundational text. No? So you cannot bring them over. You have to think of a hotel, airline, and all that. Now you can bring everybody to a conversation for as long as you manage the time zone. And you can discuss. You can have a very rich discussion of, this, of these titles that we put out. So... Uh, and then, as I said earlier, it's easier to see what uh, what the public mood is. I don't know, maybe because we're all contained, we're we're all just looking at the same screen. We can monitor what what it, what is it that they when the community pantries, you know, that issue exploded and everything. Um, one journalist of the Asia Sentinel, we were so happy that they quoted the book by a Japanese Filipinist who studied communities and was, in fact, uh, living in Maginhawa Street for so long. You know, the Japanese Filipinists are so dedicated. They learn the language. They immerse in the community. And so when this thing happened, uh, his book was quoted by Asia Sentinel saying that 
the the street is not just a space for parks and for whatever. It is a space for discourse, for protest, for for helping one another in a community. So, so that is my hope and my dream that you know these books will uh, impact more on the and and that takes that requires a lot of marketing. Uh, you know, you have to think out of the box. It cannot be the usual ways of uh, marketing. So that's really a challenge and it makes, uh, it makes your, it pays to have a young marketing group that's also tech savvy because they, they know how to do it. Now we can do book trailers. Never imagined we could do book trailers. You can hear authors speaking. Uh, and before you would just read them on pages, but now you can see them and you can hear them because from anywhere they are, you give them a set of questions and they can answer and you can put that up on your Facebook page. You know? So there are many things possible now with this, uh, with the kind of technology we have. So that's an upside. No, but we've had, we've had the privilege of having three Filipino authors um, remember Karina did a webinar not long ago, um, and that was excellent. And the attendance was amazing as well. But the three the three authors were also just just incredible as well. So you know, they were, it, was, it was really great talking to yeah. them. They were from different yeah. parts. One was in Paris, one was yeah. in Batanes, right? Yeah, and, and then one was in Manila, and and you know the one in Manila. Remember, Sarge Laquesa didn't even leave his house, right? Because he had. <laughs> All these yeah. comorbidities, but yeah, and they were talking about how they were working through yeah. throughout the pandemic. But um, honey, I wanted to ask you and Stephen as well: Would we, if we were to bring an international, if we were to do something like this with an international author? I mean, now there's no more. You know, you don't have to throw in the ticket and the hotel and everything. So, yeah. are they more willing now, or do we have to go through you, through the publishers, to to get them here, to get them to do a webinar, for example? I think motivated authors, authors are willing to do events. People like to be invited places and they've spent years writing their books. So they would like, I guess the main problem with the States is just the time change mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, that, you know, you've just got to get somebody who's a morning person to come uh, do a, an event for Manila House. But I think, absolutely. I think, I think it's exciting to people to be able to talk to people overseas my actually my first job in publishing I was what was called a foreign literary scout so I worked for a little company in the states that found books being published in America the rights of which were then bought by a publisher in Korea or you know or you know Taiwan or France or Italy whatever and watching these books then be translated and published the authors were thrilled to be out talking about their book. The idea that somebody far away in a different country was wanting to hear about their book, uh, I think is very exciting. And now obviously it's that much more easy to do um, mm. uh, with, with the technology there is. So I would think, yes, I would. I mean, in, in terms of logistics, you might literally want to go through Honey because you'll be able to maybe able to reach them more quickly, but you know, I mean, authors you can go directly to uh, and if they're stumped, they might throw you back to their publicist to help organize logistics. But, but um, no, I think they'd be very open to it. But it sounds like you have so much good local publishing developing. Maybe you don't want to be inviting too many, uh, you know, foreign <laughs> authors to show up for events. <laughs> no, for sure. There's so many really good local ones. Yes, Karina. No, actually, you can collaborate. For example, yeah. We had Nicole uh, Aboitis, she's in UC Berkeley. Her book, we just put out a local reprint of her book, Asian Place, Filipino Nation. And uh, she gave a talk in Berkeley and we just connected so, so that we could push the book locally. We, so the, so the, the whole event was sponsored by UC Berkeley Ateneo Press. And then we could uh, stream it from our Facebook page and keep a recording also so that it's all, all on our Facebook page. Yeah. So it's a matter of knowing really what's happening because they're, uh, whatever talks the American authors are doing in their, their own places are already, for all intents and purposes, available also to mm. us. And Good, yeah. Go back to YouTube and look for them. And yeah, so I, uh, yeah, that's that's why you you just really have to be more uh, 
alert and vigilant. Yeah. Yeah. I was just gonna add Stephen is right. The authors are generally very willing yeah. to do events, especially now. I mean, like they'll say, you know, waking up at two AM still beats say traveling for 14 hours and then going through jet lag. Although, of course, there's a lot of trying to travel into a new place. Um, but I think it also depends on the author. Um, some authors, actually, um, what we've seen is that sometimes authors are the ones who reach out and say that, hey, um, does this bookstore want to do an event with us? You know, um, Because they also want to promote their books because they've seen that there is, um, like, I guess, you know, there is more liberty, there's more ease in doing online events that you can reach more people. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, um, I think we've also heard the feedback that because like a lot of people are, a lot of bookstores are booking authors and they have like events one after the other, like some of them might like say, okay, can I just go on a break and maybe not like do any events right now? So they might you know, want to course it through their, their publicist their publisher so uh, but the bottom line there are many many routes that you can take like to try to invite an author uh, and yes generally what we're seeing um, right now is that the online events you know have been working very well for us uh, in fact like um, we, we just did a presentation where we had I think like six authors record like a short video um, for booksellers and it was great and you know I mean before the, the idea of a video sort of brings to mind like, okay, I have to have an editor. I have to have like, you know, a set, you know, yeah. I have to have like a, a nice room, but um, there's actually a lot of charm when you have just an author using his or her iPhone and then just recording a very nice warm message for yeah. Asian booksellers. And then, you know, you show it to the Asian booksellers and they're like, oh, that's so nice, you know, because he talks about their connection with, you know, with Asia or Philippines or with Indonesia or whichever country. So, um, yeah, I agree. There's so, there are so many more opportunities now and uh, you can explore all. Yeah, like when, before you read Ocean Bones uh, on Earth were briefly gorgeous, you can go to YouTube and listen to four interviews of him and whether that enriches your reading or you want to do that after you've read the novel. It's a, it's a very different experience now. Yeah, I think readers really expect context and they want context. They want, they want more than just, I mean, the, the book has to speak for itself, but once, if they love the book, then they want to know everything around it. I mean, it was, I really felt like when we worked with, because I worked with Elda at Penguin Classics for many years. And, you know, part of the whole Penguin Classics line is to give context because people, it's not just reading the Jane Austen, it's knowing what all people, you know, thought about Jane Austen and why it was written when it was and why it was written, the, why it was, you know, you know, why it was written the way it was, etc. And, but now all of that context is findable. I mean, you have to hunt around you different know, places, but people it, really want that depth. Yeah, exactly. It deepens your your engagement with the book, I think, because I found like I got I got from Katya and Enzo, I, I got four books and I was, you know, that I finished two and one of them was Hamnet. And I was saying, I was telling Stephen, I think before that I read, well, I know, Karina, I know we said we weren't going to get into authors and everything, but yeah. just, you know, because it's always a matter of taste, right? But I had read Maggie O'Farrell before when she first, her first two books. And then the next ones were like, Neh. you know, so I didn't read her for a long time, but there was so much hype about Hamnet. Mm. And that I said, okay, I really want to read this. And I, I, I love the book, you know. Oh, and oh, really after that, did, did, um, did Shakespeare really have a son named Hamlet? Was Hamlet kind of a, you know, um, written in his honor somehow? So it's great. So, but, and the thing is now you have all that information, right? You can go online and, and, and find out on Google and, and, you know, to see how, or maybe like in the case of Ocean Vong, like you said, Karina, how he sounds when yeah. you hear him, actually, you kind of imagine him writing it because there's that gentleness as well. He's so like, you know, gentle, right? So quiet. And so you feel that gentleness in his writing. And, and then when you see him, when you listen to him, you think, it all kind of reinforces each other, right? So I think that's the best know. with books that authors have written, and then they do an audible or like mm -hmm. an audiobook of the book. And like you, 
I, I recently read Matthew McConaughey's um, Green Lights, yeah. and you can hear him, him talking exactly mm. like in the movies, and it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, he narrated yeah. his own book? Yes, ex exactly. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> I wanted to jump in, Bambi, because you said that it's so easy to find things now, to find context online, but the other amazing thing that you can find online is the community. So you don't just, I mean, like, yes, you watch all of, like, the interviews and, you know, the videos of Ocean Ball, and then you meet the people who also watch those same things and who are fans of Ocean Ball. Mm. And then you, like, you find your community. So, like, then, you know, when readers talk about, I've found my people, you know, because, um, because there is, like, a high that you can get when you find someone and you've both read the same book and you both love it and you know that you have like the same taste and things. And these are things that are very valuable, um, even, you know, even to our sales managers, to the marketers, to the book industry, because these are the people that we need to find, you know. Um, we can create content, we can create like a lot of content, but we need to find the readers and we need to find those communities. And when your book or your you know, your whole universe, your characters, when they find their community, then that's, I mean, it's just, it's, it's lovely to watch. Um, I, I go to Instagram a lot. I go to Twitter a lot, you know, uh, Facebook, not so much, but I, I love watching like all of the discussions that readers have, that bloggers have about like certain titles or certain books, or even the discussions that are generated by, by the bookstores, by the indie bookstores, by the by the large, you know, bookstores, because it's really like all of that work that went into the book. I mean, that's your culmination to actually hear people talking about the book. And because they talk about the book, then other people find the book. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I mean, from a selling point of view, that's great. But also like from a reader point of view, that's, that's exactly what you want to happen to a book. Mm -hmm. Even book clubs should be easier. Yeah, and you're I was yeah. about to say that also um, in terms of the community, you can really find the whole community online. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Bookstagram is its own community. You can see all of these people um, sharing different opinions on the same book or different opinions on different books. And it's just so nice to see um, readers from literally all around the world um, coming together, talking about the same books. And it's also nice, I think, um, in terms of like, engaging with the authors sometimes all you have to do like a lot of authors these days i think um are very active online too and um like all you have to do is like tag them in a story or in a post and sometimes um they'll reply which is really cool like um i've had, an ex I've had a few experiences um tagging authors and having short exchanges with them too and that's not something i could have ever imagined um without this whole digital aspect so i think that's like a really one of the really um, nice things about engaging online, but um, still reading like physical books or whatever format you prefer, is just finding this community of readers. Because um, reading is a very personal experience, but it's also a very um, communal thing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We have we have a ton of questions here. Let me just go through, and there, um, I have something now that says. Um, how would you be able to say how physical bookstores are are doing in general? And well, we talked about this earlier before we started about people shifting to ebooks. Although Karina, I think you said that physical books, I mean actual books, are still stronger now. Mm -hmm. So this is me. I, I I don't think it means print is dead, right? Oh, no. I mean even Katya, the number of books that you guys sold with your first drop, right? It's funny that I did the balance when the ebook sort of revolution started in the States, what, 2008, 2009, with the introduction of the Kindle. Yeah. You know, I was at Penguin at the time, and there was this sort of panic like, oh my God, wait, where's the end of the printed book? And what was sort of fascinating to see happen is to, it sort of diverged. At that point, one of the um, divisions I was working with was Penguin Classics, and we began to spend much more time on the design and packaging of the books. So we did these beautiful lines of books like the Penguin Deluxe Classics where we got tattoo artists to do the covers or fashion designers to do the covers and really put a lot of um, investment into the quality of the paper and of the effects on the book. 
And it was almost, it was sort of this ironic, not ironic's not the right word. It was this counterpoint to this sort of panic about, oh my God, everything's gonna be digital. We're all gonna be reading eBooks. And suddenly the totemic value of a physical book became even more powerful. I mean, that line has, it's just got grown and grown. I mean, honey, you sell it. I mean, when I walk around bookstores, when I'm at Fully Booked or, you know, or National Bookstore, there are all of these different Penguin classes, these beautiful uh, packaging and people wanna own them. Um, you know, I think with digital books, at least in the States, it, there's been much more of a, an adoption and it sounds like there has been in the Philippines. But overall, when you sort of average out um, the book buying, you know, while you may have something like a John Grisham where you can, you know, when their new book comes out, 50% of the people buy it on ebook. That's probably wrong, honey. But with, <laughs> with, but the idea being with very commercial brand name authors who are maybe more entertainment fiction, they will often have a larger ebook sale because people aren't trying to own all their books in a physical um they want entertainment they want to read it quickly they really want to enjoy it but if you if you sort of average across the industry i think in the states maybe 30 percent of books are ebooks now and it's been you know, they, it's sort of settled around there so the physical book is definitely not disappearing because you can certainly have a hybrid market where you have 70 percent of your books selling in physical and 30 percent in digital and it's all quite good from a publisher's perspective we've uh, had a few customers actually who have requested specific editions of a book if they have the 25th edition with a particular cover oh. people want that book and i hope they really i hope you were trying to sell the virgin suicides 25th anniversary edition that you <laughs> put out a picador before i left Pic is that your <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> okay. but what's funny about the ebook discussion i think in the philippines is that um 2011, I used to work with um, with an ebook publisher, um, and um, even then, I think for most of the ebook publishers that I met, uh, it wasn't really a discussion of like the print book dying. Um, for a lot of the publishers that I know, you know, um, in the U.S., it's not a matter of pitting the ebook versus the print book versus an audio book. It's never been that. The discussion has always been can we provide a format that can address the needs of as many people as possible? Mm -hmm. So it's not, that, it's not that the print book is better. I mean, I hesitate to say that, although I love print books, but there are people who prefer the ebook because you know, sometimes it's hard to read like a small font in, in a print book. And I think the role of a publisher um, and like someone in the book industry is to actually recognize that. In the same way that we recognize that there are many different readers who are interested in many different things, um, there is a place for all of these things. Stephen's actually right. Um, I think um, Cyrus, Cyrus gave the presentation something like 80, 20%, um, at least for Penguin Random House, something like that. So in the US, yeah, it's roughly like 30% ebooks and 70% um, print books. And is that like a matter of, you know, you know did the print book win? Looks like it, but but it's not that the ebooks are going away, and audiobooks are also a growing category, and it's just that you provide an option for like every reader. Um, and Stephen is right. Um, you also have to know like you know um, what format will your book work best in. In the same way that publishers will decide like you know will will this book be in paperback, paper over board, hardcover. Um, um, they'll also sort of like figure out like, will this book work well as an ebook? Because there are certain genres that work well in ebook. For example, the power readers, the genre readers, those are the power readers, the romance readers. Those are the readers that will read three or four books a week, not a month, a week. Um, those are the people who benefit a lot from ebooks. Why? Because they're cheap. They're cheap, they're easy to get, they're quick reads. You know? But let's say the literary fiction and readers probably they like more of the print books because you know they take more time with them they take more time reading them so every book like you have to know like who your market is who your target market is um and sort of like position it there um which is all to say that um there is a value for all of them you know there's a value for the print there's a value for the ebook there's a value for audiobooks because you do have different markets who are interested in them and no, by them. I agree. I, I agree with that. Uh, 
in fact, we can sell PDFs to library aggregators like ProQuest, Perlego, because their 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 market is libraries. No? So a PDF would would be sufficient for them. And we now have ISBNs for PDFs. So you you it's a matter of really okay. offering, as Honey said and Stephen said, options for different markets. And that's why when we we also revised our contract. Uh, in 2016, uh, we, we had to include digital editions in the rights because like now that we are forced to go, you know, to turn many of the books into ebooks, we have to go back to all these old authors uh, or the authors of old titles and they have to give us permission to turn them into ebooks. See, so it, it, the process becomes tedious in that sense. But I also want to refer to uh, why suddenly books, the physical books have to be artifact. I mean, they have to be art books like <laughs> to own for people to buy and own. And also if you talk about book collectors and value later on for, for resold secondhand books or rare books, it will have to be physical books. You cannot resell an ebook and you cannot autograph an ebook. So still, I think it's uh, physical books, the the, the fuss over printed book dying in the, at the turn of the millennium or whenever, I think is not valid. Um, right now, we've become digital consumers ordering online, but still buying physical books. I think there's a question related to that here, Karina. I think it's for you. Are there plans for titles from Philippine or Philippine authors, I guess, to be made available as eBooks? So yeah. some, uh, you mentioned Gilda Cordero Fernando's books as well. This person is trying to find them. Ah, well, Gilda Cordero Fernando's uh, situation is different because I think she passed on uh, the rights to all GCF books to her son. And so uh, they, will have to, they will have to deal with it sooner or later because people are really looking for, for the beautiful GCF big books. Huh? Uh, coffee table books, but they haven't. Uh, so, but as far as we're concerned, we've converted 200 titles to ebooks, especially because we have to also make available to Philippine university libraries local titles. Because the irony is, when the pandemic hit and the libraries closed, students could not research or use or read Philippine titles because we didn't have, we weren't ready, they were not digitized. Uh, so all their all their subscriptions of these uh, Philippine libraries like Ateneo or La Salle or UP were all to American aggregators and only imported books were available, thousands of titles in their annual subscription. So in Ateneo, we were forced to immediately make available whatever we had as ebooks to the uh, Ateneo community. So we're probably the only one right now whose books are available in the Rizal Library through a Singaporean uh, group that we worked with as an aggregator. So we're, we're trying to convince more university presses and other uh, publishers to, to do this because it's just tragic that, you know, they have it's no- It's a massive job. Because it's because the other thing is you have to go back to the author. Yeah. So, I mean, when we had to do this, because we were forced at Penguin to do it when the Kindle came, or mm. we started digitizing stuff, but you would have to go back to a backlist of thousands of books and go to each author and say, well, when we first signed up your book, there was no such, nobody had even thought of an ebook. And we would have to explain the structure of a royalty you would get on an ebook. And it was really a little, I mean, it's amazing it's all done now, or more, more large parts of it is, but it was like ditch digging because you needed to work out the business piece of it, but then you had to, you know, you had to actually get the PDF or the EPUB ready and you had to do quality control on the conversion. And it was conversion. a huge amount, huge amount of work. On the other hand, it's now, they're now all available, which is sort of incredible that you can find these books that who would have thought they'd be available and you can just download them you know, in a second. So, but it, it's, it's, but it's definitely a challenge. Yeah. But is it, there's a question here, is it faster to publish eBooks than physical books? Well, yeah, because when you get to the PDF stage, that's it. You have to, you have to convert to EPUB and that's the book. 
you don't have to print. I mean, you don't have to go to the printers, get the yeah, book, yeah. And, you know, yeah. You don't have to distribute it. You don't have to keep them. I mean, keep them. Storage is a big problem. So I think down the line mm -hmm. for University Press, it would really make more sense to just sell PDF and digital editions, especially if the if the market continues to be just the university and the libraries and the different well, market. more and more I in the, again in the states more and more a lot of the backlist is being kept on all many publishers mm -hmm. in print on demand when you have a slow selling title and or you know so you're not keeping masses of stock you'll have the ebook always available yeah. and as print on demand technology gets better and better uh, you're able to print orders as they come in in physical books which again is is good because the his history of publishing, again, at least in the States, so much of it has been predicated on returns where you ship out a lot of books yeah. and then you hope they don't come back, but sometimes they do. And it's it's not a happy, you know, not, not a happy event when they come back and there's a lot of wastage and all of that. So in a certain way, some of these changes will end up being environmentally beneficial mm -hmm. uh, and actually more economically sort of logical. Uh, um, I think. Yes, yes, true. Yeah. I want to ask about um, bestseller lists. There's a question here asking if they're premeditated or constructed by publishing houses. I mean, the Holy Grail is like the New York Times bestseller list, right? For, you know, the New York Times bestseller list is, is really difficult to game. They people have tried to game that list and becoming, you know, people have been wildly inventive in finding ways to game that list. There was and a the New York Times has, for a, they, from they, a YA author. I remember. Oh, I yeah. don't know. I don't know. You'll have to tell us the story. I don't know the story, but tell it's, us. It, oh, <laughs> I, I don't remember the author. I just remember seeing it on Twitter, but it was like a big deal because the New York Times had to republish the list after a day. Yeah, um, oh, fascinating. Someone, no, someone I mean, tried to game it. Yeah. You'll sometimes see it on Amazon still where bestseller lists where a book will come out of nowhere and it will then be discovered later that it was because the all the guy, you know, the writer had asked all their business contacts to run out that day and buy, you know, buy a bulk order, which mm -hmm. shouldn't really count towards a bestseller list. But the New York Times, I mean, they, the New York Times changes its, I'm mean, now I'm forgetting if they're still doing it, but a few years ago, they broke it out into subject categories. So they had a whole bunch of other, for a while there, I felt like they had about 20 different lists by genre. So where there were that many more people who could call themselves a New York Times bestseller because they were a business bestseller or a how-to bestseller or a YA bestseller or a paperback bestseller. So there's a lot to keep track of. You can't really game it, but a publisher, certainly you hope to be able to drive demand through your marketing and publicity and through to drive demand in a short enough period to push your book onto the list. So there is definitely, that is a, that there are all sorts of strategies for that. It can't be gained, but it can certainly be, strat you can use some strategy to try. I've heard well, though with time. Amazon, um, people do game Amazon quite a lot and their best bestseller list. Um, I've, I've seen a couple of videos and sort of authors write about that as well. They, they, their way, their way, I mean, it ha I tend, to, I, from my perspective, it seems to happen more, I know less about YA and romance and genre, but I, when I see it happen, at least in adult lists, it often tends to happen in business and self-help categories where the person somehow manages to get a lot of bulk buys uh, made through larger accounts so they'll all be purchased on the author's behalf, or I, I don't know all the details, but it's, that's the ones that I'm most aware of, but I guess it must happen in a lot I of think other for, categories. For um, Amazon, because you have an algorithm, then yes, you can like sort of partly game it. Um, I, I have read of like several attempts, you know, and uh, some of them aren't entirely ethical, but, um, but yes, um, I, I've seen people who try to game the system because you know if you're familiar with the algorithm, then you're gonna find it, work your way around it. But but Stephen is right; you don't really, um, I don't think you can premeditate um, inclusion of a title in a bestseller list. But definitely, like um, everything that the publisher can do um, to like sort of get the titles. For example, a title comes out and says like you know 
we think that this is going to be like an instant bestseller. And when the marketing people say that we think it's going to be an instant bestseller, it's not that they're just waiting for it to become an instant bestseller. It's because they've like tried to field it already to like a lot of readers, to a lot of journalists. They've tried to create the buzz already. Um, like a lot of information is given to the sales, um, to the sales team so that, you know, the book, um, so that we make sure that we tell booksellers about the book. So there's a lot of work behind it. Um, and um, sometimes it works. Um, sometimes it doesn't work as well. But, um, but yeah, that's how you try to like sort of get a book does, into a bestseller list. It's not heavily hyped. They're heavily hyped books that end up flopping as well, right? Exactly, yes. Because yeah. um, so sometimes um, we have like, you know, when we're presented with a list um, and someone will say that, oh, this is like an in-house favorite. Like all of the marketing people, like the, the publisher, it. the editor, yeah. the sales team, they love it. And then they're really going to sell it with a passion. And then, and then it doesn't work, you know, it's sort of like, it sort of flops. And, and that happens, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no... Um, as far as I know, I mean, uh, I think um, Stephen can also like confirm this. There's no like one formula to make sure that it's a bestseller. So, you know, you try like a lot of, you know, you try like a lot of things and, um, and because of something, because of like a smart strategy, a smart positioning, smart, smart marketing on the mm -hmm. title, then it can end up in the bestseller list. And because it's a book that people want to read or enjoy reading. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the marketing is one part, but of course, you know, it's people buying it. And like A good title goes a long, long way, I've got to say. I mean, the longer, you know, I mean, oh, it, yeah. you know, they, they, I feel like if I ever, I mean, the amount of titles with girl in the title, uh, you yep. know, well, it's, it's, it's destined to be a bestseller with a girl in the title. But <laughs> when I was asking somebody what they were loving reading right now in the States, one of the beach reads since it's now just beginning summer in the States, uh, that a friend of mine who's actually the marketing director at a, at a Penguin Random House company. Uh, and, and she said, I'm reading a book called Malibu Rising. And I thought, <laughs> oh, well, that's just so that title, I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm curious and it might, it makes me think I might so. be at a beach and it could be a great beach read and all of that. And I thought, okay, well, that's a, that's a pretty good step towards a, a, a intriguing title. Malibu Rising, I think, is by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Um, yes, but yeah, that, <laughs> that, that 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 that. Uh, anyway, but yes, they're they're they're. Um, uh, yes, Girl will always be a, a forever. But even one of your big hits last year, honey, in the last few years was this "When the Crawdads Sing." Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and I think one of the reasons my one of my with my publisher hat on one of the reasons why I think. The, helped that hit is it had such a weird word in the title mm -hmm. so that once you remembered crawdads you could find it online you may not be able to remember what the book was about mm -hmm. but you hear somebody mention it and you can put in crawdads and if you search that crawdads that's probably going to come up and so you can vaguely know about the book and find it really easily and that's one of the big challenges i think we've all been talking about is is discoverability so anything even down to the right title that can help you discover a title or discover a book is so important. So a good title is definitely, or at least a title with an odd word in it, is it can sometimes help. But using that example also where the crawdads sing, um, what was funny was, at least for the international team, when we started selling it, there wasn't a lot of excitement about it. Perhaps because the word crawdads was something that was not familiar. Like, yeah, I don't think like, most Americans is, know. I didn't yeah, know what it like, was either. I was like, what, what is what that? What is it? What is it? I it's, like a, it's like a type of marsh. It's the name for a type of like shrimp in like the bayou oh, in the okay, south. Okay. Or yeah. I, I probably have that wrong, but it's a sea creature that is, that is delicious when, you know. I, a I don't crustacean know or, you or, know, or like a catfish things. or it's just sort of oh. used in Southern cooking maybe. Is that right? Yeah. I, I mean, anyway, but I'm clearly actually, we not sure <laughs> either anyway, but yeah it's so an like animal that, yeah 
so that title there wasn't like a lot of like excitement about it internationally and then it was like sort of okay you know it wasn't but then when it started to become popular in the u.s and then when that popularity was consistent but it was like always in the new york times bestseller list then there was like you know more interest you know in the international market so so sometimes it works that way and at least for me it's always pretty interesting to see like how titles you know there, there are titles that when they start out you know it's going to be big like you know at mm-hmm. during the first week or um even before on sale date like you have like huge sales and then there are these like quieter titles that you know um when they come out you don't like have a lot of sales but they they slowly build up mm-hmm. and then they're continuous and then like you know people you know people talk more about it so so yeah it's always interesting for me to see like you know which titles are are, are rich you know which ones they come out big, which ones are like make titles, um, which one- and which one get big so through do word that? of mouth. Yeah. yeah. And which titles like you probably completely <sighs> ignored even like as a team and then suddenly like, oh my God, this is so popular. Like, you know, mm. um, we should have like, you know, we should have like um, sold this in more. But um, I wanted to ask Katya and Enzo, like how did you choose the books? I mean, to start with, there's like honey, alone they published FIFA how did you score through that whole list to do you do you like you know you find some titles on Instagram or you know how how do you what do you read to read about books basically is what I'm asking I think the first thing we had to do is look at the list of titles available because there's all we'd reach out to a couple of different publishers and then that's when they'd send us the thousands of, of books available but then within that, they usually also have highlighted the hot titles, the new releases. And we sort of, I, I personally use Goodreads. So that's, I use, it's an app where I track what I've read, what I'm going to be reading and sort of the books I'm interested in. So I sort of match, mix and match the books I've read with the books available. So that's sort of how I do it personally. But then when you put together your list of books, there's also quite a lot there. So it's a lot of refinement as well from both Kajit and I, no, my end as well. Actually, I think what we initially did, like from the very beginning, um, so we reached out to a bunch of publishers. I think Penguin was the first. We literally looked at our own bookshelves and we looked at the spines of every book to see um, which books were by Penguin. And then we had to check the inside flap to see um, you know, if the imprint belonged to Penguin or like to do the different publishers also, so that we had a good place to start with. Since that was the that was the concept really, was to sell our own library. So we really looked at our own libraries first. And then we went through all of the catalogs. And I also use Goodreads, but another alternative I've found is the Storygraph, which is this really good um, women-owned, um, it's like a Goodreads, but the algorithm is better personally. And you really, um, you get a, better sense of like what the book is all about not necessarily based on reviews or five star ratings but in terms of um you know if the if it's a character driven novel or if it's a plot driven no- novel or um if like what the mood is and stuff like that so it's different um data points compared to like what goodreads is all about and i think that's it's really interesting also for readers so that's also where i was able to find a lot of the titles and also online, really, um, Instagram, like I said earlier, Bookstagram was really a, a, a good resource. Um, that's where I find a lot of titles, too, um, from the people that I follow. And also what I like to do is look at what my favorite writers are reading. So I also follow them and I see what they post about. So I think it's also good, like, if you want to read something similar to a book that you like, is seeing... Um, what the person who wrote it is also reading since you get the you get a sense of where the inspiration comes from. And so it was like all of those different factors, like from my end and from Enzo's end, that's how we came together with like this huge list from all of these different publishers too. Yeah. Katya even has her own um bookstagram as well. So if you guys are speaking about communities, she has quite a big following in terms of uh the books that she reads as well. Well what's your what's the Instagram What's what's the Instagram um, handle? Um, that? Is it on Instagram, Katya? Yeah, it's bookish. Book four underscores ish. Okay. But uh, I have a funny question here that I'm gonna ask the two of you. 
how did you're doing staff picks, right? How did you know that Enzo was the perfect partner and vice versa? <laughs> for, for for this for this for this project. Sorry. Yeah, so Katya and I have um well, we've known each other since we were kids and Katya has been like the ultimate reader. Um definitely like growing up she's read everything and I think last year even she read probably over 100 books. Well, me on the other hand, I only started reading about three years ago when I moved to the UK for university. I sort of found my love for reading somewhere along the line. I found myself reading a lot more in terms of finding books that I enjoy, which are more of philosophy, self-help, business. And then coming into quarantine, Katya started her own Instagram, uh, uh, Bookish. And it was amazing. I mean, the traction she was going, uh, getting with the book she was reading and then putting it together. Because I'm now in the Philippines, I've sort of moved back last January from the UK. I used to buy a lot, all my books from Amazon and I'd get those books in a day. Um, and now I say being here, the ability to get books that I do enjoy and love is a bit harder. Mm. So being able to reach out to the guys at Penguin Random House for copies of books that aren't available here is like the best. And Kat and I both had the same idea with books we were after to read. Um, and I think it was a perfect match because we both read different genres and adding those two together, it gives a unique Instagram experience as compared to others who are just focused on maybe business or literary fiction. Great. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just going to go through the questions because there are quite a few. Um, I, th I think we have some writers and authors um, in the audience. And um, so there's a question here. How do you balance writing about something you love as opposed to writing on a topic for a targeted market with the hope of financial gain? Karina, I'm going to say that if you're writing for University Press, you're, you don't, you're not really doing it for financial gain, right? But is there a happy balance here somewhere, Stephen or Honey? Would you be able to say uh, something I about think, that? I think, I mean, the, 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 the irony is anybody who's ever wanted to write a book, at least in the States, is secretly hoping they're going to be a New York Times bestseller, mm -hmm. whether they game the system or not, or that Oprah is going to discover them. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like we all hope we're going to win the lottery ticket. Um, I do think just having worked with a lot of authors over the years, I do think when you try and write, unless you're writing genre, if you're writing a genre type of book where you're really going after a very specific market and there's a formula to that market, I think trying to write for a market is probably is not a lot of fun um, because you're, you're, it's, you're sort of doing it fairly cynically. Um, and I think there is a weird magic to what appeals to people. And when it feels over-engineered and you yourself don't even believe in what you're writing, I think yeah. readers can feel that. Maybe that maybe that I maybe that's too idealistic, but it does feel um, um, but yeah, they're 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 no, that's sort of what I have to think. Yeah, that's my thought on that. But I would think that readers respond to authenticity, right? So if it doesn't yes. come across, right? Yes. Sorry, Karina, yes. I interrupted you. Well, I, even if I'm not doing that anymore, I've always said that, you know, your the pleasure in writing will always be caught by the reader. I mean, the same pleasure will have to be passed on to the reader. So I, I think even those who write formula novels or what to keep- Have to enjoy it. Yeah, enjoy, I- Enjoy I, it. I think, because there's up. no- there's no, there's no promise your book's going to be, a, there with all the books being published, the chances your book is going to be the one that's going to become yeah. this map are small. So you really have to, um, you have to really enjoy writing the book uh, and hope that by your enjoyment of writing the book translates into a great book. Then you got to do all the other things. You have still have to work hard to market it. You have to hope you have a good publisher. I mean, all these other things have to happen, but at least give yourself the, the fun of enjoying writing the book before you start imagining Oprah or the New York Times bestseller list. Get, get the book written first. 
Yeah. Well, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, right? To writing a book. So, yes. you know, I mean, not everyone's JK Rowling, but even JK Rowling, you know, started out writing in a cafe. She, was, she wasn't JK. Yeah, Edinburgh. she wasn't JK Rowling. Yeah. <laughs> She found a nice place to sit and started writing about yeah. something she wanted to write about. That's probably a good good place to start. And it's it's there. I think it's some of the small street in in Edinburgh that you can yes. you know, right? The cafe you can still visit the cafe. There. Yes, exactly. But yeah. I think now they make you actually you actually have to buy a coffee every hour or something <laughs> because so many people just come and sit there and try and nurse their coffee for ten hours and you know etc. But um, Honey, Random House has published, or the group, they've published a couple of Phil Am authors or Filipino authors, right? And they've done, I mean, there was one that you brought a couple of years ago with a lot of, you know, publicity. And I saw her all over the international, you know, the American press and all that. Um, this is Elaine. Gina Apostol. Elaine, yeah. Elaine Postillo. Oh, and yeah. Gina Apostol as well. Gina. That's true. Yeah, Gina. That's true. Yeah. yeah. But is it, it's, it seems to be growing, right? The appreciation for Asian American voices in, in literary fiction, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also born out of, um, I guess all of the issues that they're discussing in the US mm -hmm. like um, right now and with Random House and a lot of companies are talking about diversity, mm -hmm. how to make sure that you know everyone is welcome, how to make sure that everyone is represented and that has to be reflected and for publishing. So, so yeah, we're, we're actually seeing like a lot of like Asian voices and um, um, African American voices. So there's a lot of that, and um, and I think it helps also that Elda is there. <laughs> I mean, like Elda, yeah. Elda is a publisher for Penguin Classics, but I know that she's like sort of like shepherded other books mm -hmm. of Filipino authors. Um, through, through Penguin Random House um, with the other publishers or imprints of Penguin Random House. But, you know, she's, she's a great champion. Um, and, and yeah, so it's actually, I mean, like whenever we publish, it's funny because like when, uh, when you get the lists um, for, for the season, um, it's usually, it's the highlights, you know, I, I think Jenny and I, we sort of like, you know, like usually it's an, it's an Excel file and sort of like, zoom into like is our Filipino author is like something there from the Philippines and then you know we'll focus on that and we'll see okay we you know who would be interested in this can we make this big how do we market it to whom do we market it things like that and um it pays off because we we are actually interested in our own stories yeah. um and yeah and we brought like um several of them here actually we have like this ongoing list of um Filipino American authors that Penguin Random House has published um yeah, what I do want to see though is a Filipino author who was based in the Philippines who was published by Penguin Random House. Because right now mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of Phil M authors, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. I don't think we've published anyone who was based here. That's the next one. <laughs> we have, the uh, next one. <laughs> we have a client, Soho Press. Soho Press is our client. They who who've published um, Ichi Batapan's um, Small mm -hmm. and Smaller Circles. Oh, um, yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. But, um, she was but, based I mean, in Singapore, client. right? Am I right, yes. Sarina? Yes, she's yeah. based in Singapore. Not I many. think she was here when it was sold. But what's nice, actually, is that a lot of the young writers now um, are learning how to query agents. They you know, they have mm. community. They, they are in touch with authors yeah. from the U.S., um, they do their research about querying agents. Um, so, yeah. like, there's um, one author now. I, actually, there are several authors now who are based here who are published by U.S. publishers. Mm -hmm. um, one is a YA author. There's Gail Villanueva, who's published by Scholastic. Um, in the literary, um, in the literary um, community, there are like um, there's this. Um, author and editor, her name's Christine Slim, and she's based in Maguindanao. She's been like published by a lot of um, U.S. indie and um, university presses. So, mm -hmm. so it's fantastic. Um, I think it's great that you know there are all of these connections, and that a lot of like younger Filipino authors are are sort of like you know figuring out how to find an agent and get themselves published um, in the U.S. so that they can find a bigger audience. Yeah. Yeah. But Karina, are there any, because um, you have some amazing authors as well that Ateneo publishes, and more in the literary fiction side or even poetry, are there, are there any that you think would 
be able to break out? You know, uh, you, when you go very, to book fairs? Yeah, not very many people know that gun dealer's daughter of uh, Gina Apostol and the Raimundo Mata book were first published by Anvil. And it oh, I didn't know that. Before, yep. before uh, they were published in the U.S. The same thing for mm -hmm. E.T. Batakan. It was first published by UP Press in the 90s. Uh, but it will be very interesting to see how these books are edited and revised according to the different markets, which is also what happens to the many translations. For example, Butch Delisa's Soledad's sister has an mm -hmm. Italian edition, has a Spanish edition, and they're edited according to what yeah. the markets kind of um, expect. No? So... Uh, yeah, and I, I agree with what Hani said that be, with the technology now, it's so easy for authors to just find their own agents and publishers abroad. Yeah, in, in, it's now an international scene. There, there are no barriers. And I think there are a lot of resources now that they can access yeah. to find out how to write a query letter and you know to find the right agent or triaged already according to your genre or you know right so. Yeah even five ten years ago mm -hmm. we've been Fabio, able when are you writing your book <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> karina <laughs> no, no, no i was just trying to say that we've been able to sell rights also even for for uh, yes academic. i wanted to ask you that like cornell cornell university press has its own edition as the american or north american edition edition of the duterte reader no so we were able to sell uh and then something on his foreign policy. Sometimes we're even able to sell based on a concept or an abstract or a summary of a topic, you know. And then, uh, then we we co-publish or publish at the same time. So there there are many collaborations now that are really possible. And with the academic titles, it's not bestsellers list or whatever. It's citations. Mm. That they, they look yeah, at yeah, that is the most cited in, in so many books. So. Again, uh, uh, so uh, it's it's really a, a different world where everything is now possible. <laughs> so many things possible for for all experiences related to books. That's, whether right, sure. I mean, and, and getting you know bandwidth is so limited mm -hmm. that you know getting your query letter to the right agent or you know getting your manuscript, for example, in the hands of the right person is hit or miss a lot of the times, right? A lot of luck, I think, involved in it. Um, there's also, a question here about, oh, sorry, honey, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to share that, um, yeah, you said that it's much easier now because like a lot of things are published online. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also seen like some local authors and artists, they participate in pitch events on Twitter. So you have things like DVPit or PitMad. Um, these are hashtags. You can look for like hashtag DVPIT, hashtag PITMAD. Um, they happen, like, let's say, for a day, for 24 hours, and it's, it's a pitch party. Um, so I've seen a lot of Filipino authors who actually like pitch. And because it's Twitter, you really force like pitch in 240 characters now. And it's, um, and, and you see the, the excitement. I think, like, um, a couple of Filipino authors have have either found agents or you know they've been shown interest by agents because they participated in these pitch parties so that's also another avenue for like authors yeah well i also wanted to mention that luisa gloria a poet a filipina poet who she migrated to the states in the late 90s we published at anvil her very first collection of poetry and she is now the poet laureate of the state of virginia oh that's amazing yeah Amazing, right? Karina? Yeah, amazing. What, what's her name again? Luisa Igloria. Luisa Igloria. Yeah. Okay, we'll look out for that. Uh, are there any literary journals, local literary journals here that um, writers or, you know, um, might, might like to be, might like to get a hold of? Would you know of any? Uh, but these are more academic rather than... Uh, well, there are book reviews in many magazines and these uh, blogs and sites, right? For for popular titles, but for for the academic, for the university presses, uh, there are literary journals in Ateneo, in UST, in UP, 
And but there are also many anthologies now where many Filipino writers, whether poets or fictionists, are able to join internationally organized because they just send their their sample, their sakol, they solicit uh, submissions, and their their works are selected. So they come out in international anthologies, yeah. literary anthologies. Well, I think Mara Kosson is here in the audience. I can see her. And Mara, I think hey, Mara. used to publish uh, or maybe still publish Man Manila Review. Am I right? Did I get yeah. that right? It was a literary journal. It, it's, it's not publishing anymore. Can you revive it, Mara? <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait. I think I have time for... Um, do self-published books have a chance of succeeding, given that there seems to be a lot that goes behind them, behind getting them noticed? Uh, are there self-published books ever picked up by big publishers? Yes, definitely. Yeah. I think the, 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 the real challenge is um, for self-publishers is you need to be highly motivated to sell your own book to begin. Because mm. like when I was saying, and maybe 38 is maybe uh, over counting of people or under, I don't know. There are a lot of people involved in publishing a book. Imagine all of those people, if you have to play all those roles yourself as an author, you better be pretty motivated and highly ener ener energized to, to, to do all those roles and be really willing to go out and um, as uh, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert of Eat, Pray, Love that we published at um, Penguin, she, there was an article on her where she was talking about how as a kid, her mother would make her go around the neighborhood and sell sandwiches. And if you're gonna be a successful author, you have to be ready to go out and sell the sandwiches. Um, and that is, I think, you have to think about it on all fronts. I don't, haven't seen it recently, but in the early days of, a lot of the self-publishing at Amazon, so this is maybe 2011, 12, 13, mm -hmm. there were a lot of big six-figure deals in the States for self-published authors. I mean, obviously, you know, Honey, I mean, you practically, it. you know, you've got E.L. James with all her, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, oh my God, I'm, for, you know, the, I'm forgetting the whole name, 50 Shades, the 50 I mean, that shades. was self-published. <laughs> Yes, and actually her new one just came out. Uh, so so that is, will probably be another summer beach treat in the States. But um, I've seen less of those stories lately in terms of those big deals off somebody who became massive self-published, but it certainly happens. I think a lot of what's happening even more is I think agents are watching self the self-publishing world more than they were. So I think they're finding people and maybe not reselling that same book, but finding an author whom they are developing for future books out of being self-published. But I think the real challenge for self-publishing is you have to wear all 38 hats and really have to be highly energized to be out there to figure out all the pieces of publishing your book, self-publishing your book. I know a lot of self-published authors, especially um, in the local romance um, community, um, romance class, you know, um, almost all of them are self-published. Um, I think Karina, before you left Anvil, you picked up some of them. So they were initially uh, self-published romance titles that came out in ebook. Um, and then um, Anvil picked up some, I think Summit picked up some. Um, and then I don't know if someone else picked it up. And then um, finally, like some of them decided that they would rather self-publish because they knew that their market was more on Amazon. They bought like more eBooks and it made more sense for them. Um, and then you also hear stories of authors who like self-publish and then, you know, they, they became very successful, but it is exhausting because exactly as Stephen says, you have to do everything. You mm -hmm. have to sell it. You have to like, you have to market it. You have to watch the data and figure out how to position it and to whom to sell it. And, you know, you have to pitch it to people. So that's a lot of work. And like some authors say that, um, okay, the publisher is interested that I'm just gonna give the publisher the right so that um, the author doesn't have to worry about all of those other things. They can just worry about writing and the publisher will take care of everything. But yeah, that's happening um, in a lot of fronts. Um, it's happening for Wattpad. <laughs> it's happening for, yeah. you know, a lot of like um, these fan uh, these fan fiction sites, Stephen's right. A, a lot of people are watching the platforms right now where um, where young 
kids, you know, in their teens or early 20s are publishing stories chapter by chapter, whether it's Wattpad or what are the other sites, or even things like Webtoons, you know, these open platforms where people can publish their stories. And then, like, a lot of publishers or agents will just look at, you know, which one has the most reads, which one has the most engagement, which one is popular, which one seems to be like a convention of a, of a niche of a zeitgeist, you know, a lot of interest, and, and then they pick it up. So there's actually a lot of interesting models right now going on in publishing. Um, a lot of roads to getting published, to finding, um, to finding your market, to finding your readers. You can go with a traditional publisher, you know, local or international. You can take the self-publishing route. But, um, but I think bottom line is that all of that it just takes a lot of work. I mean, for some people, they may get lucky. But for most people, it's really just a lot of work. Whether you're querying authors, waiting for a response for your query, waiting for a response, um, from the publisher or you're writing your your story on Wattpad or any other platform um, and you're marketing your own titles. Um, there's just really a lot of work involved. Um, Karina, are you finding that, well, for Honey and Karina, I think this is meant for, um, are you finding there, are you getting proposals or manuscripts for pandemic-based writing well more on the academic side and maybe honey are you seeing pandemic themed books coming out in fiction uh okay what well, this year or this month or next we will be putting out uh, a collection of <clears throat> case studies as covid responses uh, across different disciplines which is edited by uh, Edalberto de Jesus and Manulet Dairi, her former secretary. Oh, yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah. And then we, we uh, Virgilio Almario, natural artist for literature, translated Boccaccio's The Cameron because that was mm -hmm. about Black Plague and mm -hmm. how a group of young people, Italians, secluded themselves and just went through that plague by telling each other stories. So he chose about 33 stories from 100 and translated that, them to Filipino. So there, there are more books, uh, as I said earlier. I think we, we really have to watch out for, for new ideas, for, for a better mm -hmm. normal for, for, for the country, for, for the world, our position on climate change. So, so as I said earlier, maybe you just have to go back to some old text, old, bo old books. That's how the backlist suddenly sometimes mm -hmm. becomes more meaningful now or more useful. Uh, then you just have to, uh, uh, for example, for, the, for the, the political situation, when we reissued um, conjugal dictatorship, mm. an expose of Primitivo Mijares, who used to be the confidant of Marcos. And when he went to the States, he, he turned and testified in Congress against all the abuses, right? So that's the that's the story expose of a dead man. So you don't you can't change it. You can't touch that. But what we did was to annotate every almost every page to explain to new readers what these, what these people were, yeah. what these places were, what these events were, because they don't know Plaza Miranda anymore. They don't know Raul Manglapu. So many. So so the what used to be a very thin book is now like a doorstop. <laughs> it's about 700 pages. No? So, but it becomes more useful. No? So I don't know if we will begin to do things because not very okay, many writers can write immediately. Or, Honey is going to show it. Honey has the book. It is thick. <laughs> it's that thick now. Wow. Yeah, it's okay. thick now. Yes. So, but it makes you understand many things mm -hmm. that happened before and maybe happening again now. So, uh, so there, it will take a while, maybe for fictionists, maybe the short story writers and the poets yeah. need to deal with it. But uh, it's also, I think, the women will have to be at the front lines of this writing because it's really the women who are or the front lines of the crisis right whether they're managing their homes or their offices mm -hmm. i think they're 
keeping everything uh, trying to serve, make everybody, every every community, every household survive. You know? So it's it's really also a, a a woman's story, a women's stories. The pandemic. So I would I would expect anthologies, you know, collections of essays by women. Uh, so, but when it comes to the maybe political or sociolo sociological, psychological, like how did this pandemic or lockdown affect the emotional and psychological state of young people who never got out for over a year now? So that, that takes a while to study. And to, so maybe not immediately, but I'm sure all this, all, all these new works about the pandemic will, will uh, be written and published and be published. I right, say so you were asking, Bombina, if we're selling any pandemic titles. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are you, seeing, are you seeing? Yeah. Yeah. Fiction? Yeah. I mean, are you seeing any fiction? To be honest, for fiction, um, I have one. Actually, I'm going to talk about one tomorrow for, for one presentation. It's a YA title and it's a love story, a YA love story that happens within the first two months of the pandemic. And it's about like, um, uh, a, a boy who is privileged, he's rich, and then the girl is actually a shopper. You know, like one of those people you ask to shop you know, um, mm. in the grocery because you don't want to go out. So, so there's, um, I think, as far as I can recall, yeah, that's that's one fiction pandemic title. But we have a ton of nonfiction yeah. pandemic titles. Yeah, I can imagine across um, across ages, adult to kids, you know, we have like a what is a coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic title. Uh, and it's it's actually interesting, but like, I think because I was reading the question um, asking about like what are the pandemic titles, I think if you ask mm. like what the pandemic titles are, um, you know, you can have like fiction titles where authors, because it, it does take a while for a book to reach on sale date from the time that it's acquired and some authors um, I think they're trying to like work in the new world that we're in, the new situation that we're in. But if you think about pandemic titles, the way that we look at it and the way that we sell it, it'd be more of like, I don't know, a sourdough, a sourdough book, a baking book, um, books about um, gardening. I mean, that's like super popular right now. Books about entrepreneurship. I mean, like there's so many people who are asking for books about entrepreneurship because like everyone, um, is like looking to put up their own business, um, and for or or books about books that deal with I suppose like anxiety or mental health, um, mm. and sort of like maybe like poke fun at yourself or like um, just books that uplift you. So those are the I like if we think about like books of the pandemic. They might not necessarily be about the pandemic. Um, definitely those books are coming. They're here for nonfiction. I'm sure they're coming for fiction. But like there's so many, what the pandemic has done is sort of like revealed like all of these things that people are interested in. And, you know, because the world has also changed. So reading tastes have also changed. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Karina mentioned the backlist. That's exactly right. Um, if you have like a strong backlist, if you have like a wide backlist, then that's something that you can easily take advantage of like in like offering. Like if someone's looking for an entrepreneurship title, you know, you have like all of these entrepreneurship titles. Um, like there are stories about, you know, this book about sourdough baking that was like doing okay, but then suddenly saw a spike in sales because of like everyone's locked down and everyone's making mm -hmm. sourdough. Um, so yeah, those are sort of like the way that I guess we, we'd like to think of, right? Like think of like books about pandemic. Um, no, I, I think, yeah, you can see all these things, right? Uh, I see the trends as well. I mean, you see it on, on media, what, what the trends, like as we cope with the pandemic, they're reflected in the books that come out as well, right? Like baking and, you know, all that. Um, and gardening. I think and gardening. In fact, um, there's there's a comment here for Katya and Enzo to, to um, get books and art, plants, gardening, and books about books, please. So there you go. You have your mandate from your um, and from your your customers. Um, I think there's a question here.
are about writing to publishers. Maybe Stephen, you should take that. I think that will be our last question for today, and then we'll just, um, sum up. Which question is it? There's a question here in the Q and A box. What's the best way to pitch a work you're still writing to publishers? I yes, finish, finish it. it. That's <laughs> the. I mean, it, uh, that that said, actually, and Karina can speak. Maybe it's different here, but it's different with fiction and nonfiction. If you have a very good nonfiction idea, you can certainly write a proposal. Uh, which can be 30 to 50 pages, which, you know, outlines what your book's about, maybe has a few sample chapters. You can um, query agents with something like that. And often if it's a good, if you're the person to write the book and it's a good proposal, uh, all, you know, agents can make deals based on a proposal if it's nonfiction. But in, again, unless you're writing, unless you have a track record of writing genre fiction or a best-selling track record, it's really difficult, if not impossible to, no, I shouldn't say impossible. There are always exceptions, but it is very, very difficult to sell an unfinished work of fiction. If you're writing a work of fiction, go ahead and finish it. Because sometimes you, often you as the writer won't even understand what it is you've written until you finish it. Uh, so, uh, and publishers are very, publishers want to know where your book ends. So, um, uh, you, you don't worry about reaching a publisher if you haven't finished your book. Go, just focus on finishing your book, then worry about finding a publisher. Or, I mean, these days, finding an agent more than a publisher, at least in the States. It may, it may be different in the Philippines where people will go directly to um, the publishing houses. Uh, and it sounds like the editors here reach out directly to authors whom they're interested in. You do that as an editor in the States to some degree, but they, they, the industry basically is the agents are the primary conduit, um, the authors to the publishing houses until the deal and relationship is made. And then the publisher and the author build their own relationship. Yeah, it would be different here, no? That the literary agent doesn't really exist. Yes, yeah. This is the Anvil, of course, was, was straight to Anvil and they had a great team and it, it was um, it was very daring of Anvil, I have to say, to take on my my novel, but it was a really great experience all around. Yeah. But um, I think I just want to go around and ask everyone for maybe advice to writers or advice to readers or something as we end, end tonight's today's session. Maybe, do you guys want to start Katya and Enzo? I think for me, I'd say when you find the book, and for me, what got me into reading really was if I find a book, I want to make sure that I enjoy my reading time. Um, enjoying my reading time, similar to how I watch TV on Netflix. If I, if I don't like a show, or if I'm reading a book and I'm maybe one fourth into it, um, you're not really, in love with the book, then put it down and feel free to move on to the next book. So there's no, I'd say contract for you or sort of to re read the book all the way through if you're not enjoying it. Katya? Um, I think for me, it's I learned this from one of the books I read recently, which I can't stop talking about called Goodbye Again by Johnny Sun. Um, it's really just finding time to read. A lot of people ask me like, how do, how do I get into reading? How do I, find time to read like I'm not a big reader but I really want to um, pick up a book again it's just really making time for it I mean even five minutes a day ten minutes a day to just read a few pages read a chapter and slowly build on that um, I think it becomes a habit after a while and like Enzo said just make sure you're also enjoying it like if if it's just not working for you it it might not be the book it might just be um, you in this particular moment and you can always pick it up again um, another time when you're more in the mood for reading that sort of book. So yeah, that's it. Um, honey? I'm gonna get up on my soapbox um, and say that the Filipino is a reader. Um, and this has been my message even before Penguin Random House, um, because I mean, I've like seen so many articles and even like people in the industry saying that Filipinos don't read. How can we make the Philippines a reading nation? It already is. Um, and the Filipino is the reader. And I'm not just, I mean, like when we put up the Filipino Reader Con, that was our belief, but then working where I work now, I know 
Um, but also if you're just a casual observer, you can see it. Um, you can see it in the fact that, I mean, sure, um, foreign titles sell a lot of books, but actually local titles sell, sell way more units than we do. Just the idea of like, you know, Filipino romance novels um, selling, let's say, 40,000 copies, 100,000 copies. The fact that Wattpad's second biggest language um, is Filipino because we have like so many people uploading their stories and reading their stories there. The fact that... Um, yeah, uh, the Wattpad books at their height, they, uh, I remember one of the publishers was saying that he could sell like 100,000 units in six months of the 10 most popular titles. Um, because sometimes when you think of like, you know, the, the, the reading public, sometimes it's limited to a certain um, set genre. of Filipinos, like the ones who read literary fiction or the ones who read like a certain genre. But if you think about it and if you just look, um, Filipinos are readers, you know, it's not a matter of saying let's make them know. I think it's a matter of acknowledging that Filipinos are readers and they read these different types of things and all of these things are legitimate. Um, and, and yeah, and if like, you know, um, if someone like looks down in, I mean, just the idea that I saw, um, these really long lines in Manila International Book Fair of like these young authors who used to publishing on Wattpad and like they have screaming fans, like screaming fans. And it's amazing. Like it's amazing. So like we might prefer certain titles, but they prefer certain titles. And it's just fascinating to me to see like this whole breadth of Filipino readership because it's there. So that's it. Karina? Uh, yeah, I, I've always said that, you know, the year 2020, uh, 2020 is supposed to be the best vision, clear vision, right? It's supposed to stand for clarity. So I think that 2020 really, uh, we saw many things and we have to reflect on these things and there's so many things to change and to, uh, as Arundhati Roy said, it's it's a portal. No? You 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 enter into a, a new uh, a new world altogether. So I'm kind. Of, this may not be politically correct to say, but it is an exciting time because that's what happens when you have a crisis. It brings about new things, uh, a, a golden age maybe after. But yeah, so this is uh, a, a really good time for writers and readers. Things have changed, uh, uh, the experience of reading, the experience of writing with the kind of technology and the, the times that we are in right now. And as I said, uh, it should be, it should bring uh, us to, a, it should be a portal to bring us to a new world of new ideas, new systems, new things that we'll have to, we will have to take care of and do because we've seen how the old systems didn't work and brought us mm. to 2020. So I think that's the point of 2020, to have seen things so clearly that we should know what to do next you know, to, for a better, a better world, a better normal, a better country. Yeah. And books can be your conduit to that better yeah. normal, right? Definitely. Yeah. The reading and write, the writing and reading the book that play a very important role for all these ideas, new ideas. Exactly. So, so I really see, agree. <laughs> after a year and a half of being a, after a year and a half of being an honorary Filipino. Yes, <laughs> I'm, fine. I'm, I'm leaving next week, but um, yeah, who knows? Anything, we all know anything can happen in three days here. So who, who you know, in this current world we're living in. <laughs> but I wanted to just continue just to finish um, answering the same question to continue what Karina said, because I tended to edit more nonfiction than fiction. And one of the things I found most exciting as a non, with my editorial hat on, is when you have a great, when an author has reached a great new idea that, um, and I guess you were saying, Karina, that in, in the Philippines, there, there's less of a tradition and culture of a sort of public intellectual space where people are sort of meeting and, you know, whereas in the States, uh, a nonfiction author, you know, can get booked all the time on NPR and CNN and even 
mass television channels, authors are still looked to as a as an authority and idea source. And I was thinking one of the last books I edited, which is actually published sort of a month before the pandemic, and, and I was no longer working at, at the publishing company at the time, but it was called Extreme Economics. Uh, and actually Enzo, maybe the guy who wrote it was a, a, a young economist who had worked at the Bank of England named Richard Davies. And he'd done this fascinating, it was almost a survey. He'd found nine, he'd looked at nine different countries around the world or cities around the world that were economically extreme in some way. Either, you know, a town in Japan, which has the highest age, uh, median age of its inhabitants. Or um, he looked at Banda Aceh and how they how they recovered so quickly after the tsunami. Or he looked at a prison in Louisiana and how the economy worked within the prison where there was no there was no money. And he it was really fascinating where he sort of almost looked at all these systems the way you would look at uh, the physical body or DNA and look at how a human system recovers from an extreme shock. And in this case, he was looking at it through the lens of the, the economy. And I think that's just, a, I, when I, as soon as I bought that book on a proposal and then edited it with him over about a year and a half, I was just incredibly excited by that idea because it was such an interesting way to look at humanity and look at economics and look at how different cultures react differently to shocks. And, and it feels probably like even an even more timely book as we all come out of this uh, than maybe it even was at the time it was published in January, 2020. But um, yes, the idea, I think if you read a nonfiction book that you're excited about that has ideas in it that you are excited about is spread those ideas as well to get people out there reading, you know, reading the book too and talking about some of those ideas that, that uh, you know, can start conversations. I'll check that book out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it might be it might be a good pick for staff picks. And if, for the writers out there, as I said, finish your book. Though it sounds like, as Honey pointed out, maybe you can just start uploading it chapter by chapter on Wattpad. Um, but maybe, probably not a book on extreme economics. You probably need to be uploading more of a that, YA. That's how Tolstoy. To, that's wow. how Tolstoy started, right? Yes. yes. Tolstoy. Yeah, I, and Dickens, it was chapter after chapter in, in exactly. the magazine, serialized, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you never know. Yes. But thank you. I mean, as we all know, I think we're all readers here and, and bookworms. And so books are magic, really. I mean, when something like the words on the page and the ideas and the images that they conjure just like transport you, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. I mean, that's, that's a special kind of magic, I think. And so on that note, I'd like to thank our amazing panel of speakers today and, and everyone who attended. Um, thank you for bearing with us. It was like nerd central here talking about books and authors. And um, this talk will be uh, on YouTube in a day or so. So if you wanna catch it there, um, a replay, you can, you can just go to YouTube to the Manila House channel. So thank you everyone again for joining us this evening. Have a nice evening and we'll see you again. Thank you, Bambina. Thank, thank you. Bye everybody. Thanks, thank everybody. you.